the young kid who turned professional who just failed to make the Olympics. If I'd have said that you win English, British, European, and world titles and say you earn, earn enough money, then I'd have bit your hand off for him. The sport nowadays with social media, it's a, a no popularity contest and people with the biggest following are getting mm. the biggest. Like even like Ryan Garcia this weekend, Absolutely. he's getting opportunities that his ability doesn't quite merit. Just out of curiosity, what do you make of Whitaker? He's trying to be like Naz if he Naz yeah. was doing it at Madison Square Garden and world title mm -hmm. fights, not against like journeyman. That's that's what's being mooted around is that potentially that you could be fighting Anthony Yards. Um, this is up front with me, Simon Jordan. I believe there are a lot of vacuous, uninformed, unchallenged opinions out there. I want to get to the bottom line and cut through the nonsense. So on this podcast with William Hill, I'm going to get people with strong views who think they can stand them up under proper scrutiny. There's a good chance I might learn something along the way, but more importantly, so might you. Joining me in today's episode, the youngest of four brothers from one of the most famous boxing families, the Smiths. He gained British and European success at super middleweight before overcoming George Groves for the WBA strap. His ascent in the sport took him face to face with Canelo Avarice, his first career loss, before more recently falling short in his bid to become a two-weight world champion against Arta Betabiev. Callum Smith, welcome to Up Front. Oh, thank nice you. Nice to Thanks see you, mate. Me. Yeah, and you? Are you a red or blue? Red. So the fact that my team just beat your team on, on Sunday, here, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not <laughs> going to hold us in good stead or bad stead, but no, we'll move on yeah. from that quickly. Listen, nice to see you. Yeah, oh, I'm a big you. fan of you and your brothers, so it's nice to have you here. I talk to various sports stars across all the different sports, whether it's tennis, cricket, football, and boxing, but predominantly my favourite conversations are with you guys. Yeah. I suppose normally what I would ask is why did you go into boxing but I guess the question with you is how could you have not done yeah exactly definitely that I think I was a, a shy quiet kid when I when I was younger and I'd have probably never dreamed of walking into a boxing gym saying I, no, I want to be a fighter but I was always around the boxing gym it was overdrove from where I grew up in, in Kirk. And three brothers, of course. Yeah, I mean, yeah. three brothers were in there, so I was always in there. My dad done, like, the circuit of the daytime with the key fitters, and it was just a familiar place for me. It was, like, my second home, so I was always in and around her, and with you no know, four brothers, we were always going to mm -hmm. box in the house against each other, so it was always just something. It was always on the TV, so it was kind of felt natural, and I think as a as a younger brother, I always just, you know, I, I admired my, my yeah. three older brothers, and wanted to be just like them. And I think if these are pick snooker tennis, I'd have followed them into whatever they wanted to do. And you no, know, still to this day, I've always just had to follow my brothers. And I think I was quite lucky as in, when you set the bar, I want to be a world champion. Whereas every time I started boxing, my brothers were national champions. So I kind of put the bar there. I want to be like national champion like them. And then I want to represent my country like them, the Commonwealth Games, Olympics. And then when I turned professional, like it wasn't like they were all world champions. The Paul was British champion. So that mm -hmm. kind of set the bar there. So I've always chased and wanted to be like them and I think that that's no, still to this day now I'm still but trying to do it. It's quite unique isn't it? I mean you see in other sports you see fathers that have sons that go and and, and follow them into the sport or become sportsmen in their own rights but there's four brothers is that the com is that the content of your family? Have you got any sisters? Or yeah I've got two younger sisters. You've got two, yeah, younger, two younger sisters. sisters. Right. But the boys have all gone into boxing. Yeah. Why was that? Was your, I mean, was that your father's love? Was it something that he did himself, or was it just something that arrived on the scene for your oldest brother and everyone else followed him behind? A bit of both. My dad, I think, he had three amateur fights, but he was always a big boxing fan. So he was right. always like by the boxing news magazine every week, always watching like the fights on the weekends, like the Mike Tyson, Sugar Ray mm -hmm. Leonard. They always had the video, the Four Kings, Leonard, Geran, Haynes, mm -hmm. and Hagler, and. But we just basically lived a stone's throw from the amateur gym and my oldest brother Paul just went in with a few of his friends and just decided to take her up and liked it, was good at it and stuck at it. And I think Stephen being the typical younger brother, he's yeah. the closest to him in age, just followed him in and then it was just so on and so forth. So yeah, my dad was always a big boxing fan, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say he was a fighter and that's why we kind of done it. I think it was just convenient that we lived so close to the Rotunda Amateur Boxing Club and so it was just a knock on and effect with the four of us. Yeah. Insofar as the background... I, I've often spoken, when I've spoken to Kel Brook, when I've spoken to Carl Froch, when I've spoken to Derek Chisora, when I've spoken to Barry McGuigan, the, the, the origin of their sort of arrival in boxing comes from a background of either wanting better or coming from something quite difficult. What's the backdrop for you and, and your brothers? Yeah, like I think like we were born and raised on a council estate, but I wouldn't say we had it 
no tougher than anyone else. I think you no, know, we grew up in Liverpool, but it was more. I'd say I'd love to. I think people want like the the story that you no know, boxing saved me, and if it wasn't for boxing, I'd be in jail or mm-hmm. dead. And it, that genuinely isn't the case. Like I say, I was a shy, quiet kid. I just follow my brothers and found something that that I was good at, and I've I love the competitive side of it of being the best. I love winning. And I think that's what keeps me, kept me coming back over the years. It wasn't like the violent side of it. Like some fighters genuinely just love fighting mm-hmm. and they'd fight, you no, know, till they're old enough, so they, um, till they're too old. But mine more being a success and setting goals, achieving it, setting a goal, achieving it and just chasing. I've always enjoyed the chase. But it's such a unique sport though, isn't it, Callum? Because it's the hurt business. I don't need to yeah. tell you, you do it. And so you've got to have this mindset of, of, of of the motivation and you're saying to me that your motivation is simply because you enjoyed it your brothers enjoyed it and you got an sense of achievement out of it yeah but again it, it's still about knowing you're going to go into something and get hurt and hurt others whilst doing it 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 just it just it fascinates me because playing football or cricket or snooker yeah. or tennis and all these other sports are competitive yeah and you have to be competitive in it but you don't have to be worried too much yeah. about the physical well-being of yourself. And that's a unique mindset that you guys have. Yeah, I think it is a strange one because obviously, unfortunately, within boxing, there is no fatalities, there is serious injuries. And, yeah. and as a fighter, you do see it happen and no momentarily you just think, well, you kind of reminds of the risks that you're in. But I think you just always, it's like getting on an airplane, you just think it won't be me. You'd mm-hmm. like, you always just think you'll be you'll be okay, so to speak, where there's... I don't know you do as a fighter I do know the risk and I think as I've got older and I've got children you, you, you are aware it. of them yeah. a little bit more but I think it does take a strange mentality to to be a fighter and like I said as a child it's not something I'd have you know, put me on and volunteered to do but it kind of just felt natural to do so. Did you feel any pressure or any push from either your father or the circumstances of Paul fighting and Stephen fighting and Liam fighting and this inherent responsibility or obligation to do something similar it, no not really i think i just always like i said i had last my three brothers growing up and i always wanted to just be just like them and more uh, no case of not wanting to let them down and stuff like that then you no know, they're all winning titles and yeah I'm, maybe so but no i think i always get asked the question did they feel a pressure to being the, the last one coming yeah. through and my brothers are all champions and absolutely no that was gonna any, be my next if question if i'm not any yeah. good yeah but yeah. If, if, if anything i find it Obviously, there was pressure with it. Like I see with Paul's lad, he's mm-hmm. fighting now, he's 17, and there's a lot of pressure on him coming through, and I do feel sorry for him at times, but I don't know. I find it beneficial. I had three older brothers to look up to, and yeah. basically three coaches who'd been there and done it, and every level I reached, whether it was a national final, the Commonwealth Games, I felt like I'd been there before because I'd been there, my brothers had been right. in the changing rooms, walking the ring with yeah. them, fighting for world titles. So I think it kind of gave me an experience dead on, on young shoulders. The minute I've seen Liam win a world title, if you know my brother who have shared the room with as a kick him win a world title, then mm-hmm. I can definitely win one. So it was more to say I'm I'm from the same family of the same upbringing. If they can do it, yeah. I, then I definitely believe I can. And no, I benefited from having three older brothers who were mm-hmm. all professional fighters rather than feeling the pressure of being being the youngest of them. Which um which of your brothers? All your brothers are very different characters. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm a, an admire, I'm not saying it because you're here. I, I you know, I, I remember watching your brother Paul in the first fight against Arthur Abraham, and I watched him before that, obviously, yeah. just feeling enraged at the injustice yeah. of that decision because I yeah. thought we won the fight. Yeah. He thinks he won the fight. I think most people that were sensible thought we won the fight. Yeah. But you've got three brothers of very differing personalities. I think the perception of you is that you're quite quiet and unassuming. Um and 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 not a showman. Liam's a bit more of a showman, isn't yeah, he? Yeah. Um, but what are the characteristics? I mean, I, I always thought Paul was a great speaker, and every time I speak to Paul, I, I really enjoy listening to him. I don't always yeah. agree with some of the things that he says, yeah. and I'm pretty damn sure he doesn't agree with a lot of the things yeah. I say. Right? But yeah. I like listening to him. I yeah. think he's a really good observer and a really good analyst, and I thought he was a really good fighter. Mm. Liam is a little bit more chippy and a little bit yeah. more flamboyant. Yeah. And and Stephen, I don't I haven't followed quite as much. Yeah. Stephen's but, very like the intelligence, like academically, was yeah. very clever in school and stuff. Liam's more like, Liam's always fighting as a kid and getting brought home by the police for climbing on like the school roof and stuff. Liam's always been like the rogue out of his right. all. And I think you can see it now in his press conference and stuff. He doesn't sure. really doesn't hold hold his tongue and he just <laughs> say exactly what he thinks yeah. and stuff and he won't care. I the the last press conference. Yeah, yeah exactly. I was talking about that before <laughs> outside. But yeah, he's just always say, says what he thinks and he doesn't try and... Doesn't, sugarcoat it. Yeah, doesn't mm-hmm. sugarcoat it, doesn't tone his voice down, doesn't speak anymore correct. He doesn't speak mm-hmm. to 
you as if he's speaking to his mate in the pub at home. So it's just, he's always been the, the straight talker. And I think because we're so close in age and because he was so outgoing and so that's probably why I'm a, mm -hmm. I was as quiet as I was as a kid. And I think when you get to know me, I'm obviously, I come up with Michelle a little bit more, but I've always just been quiet and a man of few words. But I'd say um, I've always just been motivated by just being the best. And I think put me in a boxing ring, I can't just switch and I can become pretty aggressive and spiteful yeah. when I'm in the ring. But the minute the bell goes, I'm back to, you know, I'm just very, very laid back, very quiet. And Would you like to, to be a bit more? Um, I mean, we're all what we are. Me. Sometimes I'd like to be a little bit quieter and keep my yeah. peace to myself, but I don't. <laughs> um, but would you like to, because part of this sport, and you see people that haven't achieved things, haven't won world titles and, and run around giving big noise and yeah. getting paid enormous amounts of money yeah. and lots of attention, and you can probably guess what we, I might be speaking about yeah. in that respect. Do you ever look at and think to myself, if I were a little bit more of a showman, a little bit more gregarious, a little bit more not so much flamboyant, but shoot from the hip, that it might have given you... Because I think sometimes with you, when I think of you, I think you perhaps haven't gotten the attention mm -hmm. and the recognition that you deserve um, outside of the really educated circles, the people yeah. that know what you're capable of, know what your values are. Do, yeah. you, do you look at and think... I wish I could be just a little bit more extrovert, maybe a little bit more like Liam, because maybe I'd get a little bit more attention and people might pay a little bit more attention and the purses might have got a little bit bigger, a little bit quicker. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Obviously, I think I've always said it's a bit late now, I've also started yeah. doing it now. It, people say, you know, it's an act, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, definitely, like, especially the, the sport nowadays with social media, it's a, a you know, popularity contest and people with the biggest following are getting mm. the biggest, like, even like Ryan Garcia this weekend, Absolutely. he's getting opportunities that, his ability doesn't quite merit, so you to speak. Think... He, not, not at the minute. No, I don't think he's as good as what the, name he, the name he carries, mm -hmm. so to speak. And you get a lot of great fighters who don't get the, you know, the, the yeah. recognition because the the choir and I say with social media now it's more about followers and TikTok and so and YouTube and stuff. And so yeah, if it was a bit more out there, then maybe it'd have been a bit more of a name. But in the long run, it it's probably I like, I like a quiet life I like taking my kids yeah. to school I like I, I wouldn't like to be recognised everywhere I go so to speak but yeah I think and again it probably in a different time in career then it probably would have been beneficial but I think I was very lucky with the World Boxing Super Series mm -hmm. that was no that paid very well so I kind of got the money without having to yeah. boost my profile up and say and then speak and say stuff that probably wasn't me as, as a person like I think Liam enjoys that side of it he enjoys it's his character every head to head he has he, you know give it three seconds mm -hmm. he'll say something in the head to head and you know he just wants that bit of back and forth where I've always just been quiet and like I said I've always thought if I was to start doing it now it, it'd be a you know, blatant act and no one would kind of believe it Is, I mean given given that you're a very close-knit family I mean I see I saw you at the fights I've seen Stephen obviously in the corner with mm -hmm. um, Liam Gill I think, I think Stephen gave him a Huge bollocking in the first fight against Eubank, didn't he? Yeah, Sent yeah, him out yeah. and then cleaned out Eubank in the next round, didn't yeah. he? Um, how big is loyalty for you and your family? I mean, it, it must be a big thing given you're so close, but how important is it to you? Yeah, it's massive. I think it's strange because it's all I've ever known. I, like, I see some families and brothers who don't speak to each other and stuff, and it, it, it blows me mind. Like, I think we've always been a very, very close knit family, and I think boxing's kind of helped us stay as close as we are. Is boxing a low sport, Callum? Is it no. a loss? But it's not, is it? No, 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 not him. Um, Why do you think it's not? I think money. I think when money's involved, loyalty's not really, not really as strong. I think you no, know, a lot of coaches are in it for the money. A lot of managers are in it for the money, and promoters, promoters yeah. definitely in it for yeah. the money. And I think if you can save a purpose to them, then it's great. I think the minute you can't save a purpose, purpose for them, then your surplus requirements. Yeah, there's, yeah, it's. I think with boxing, it's a massive conveyor belt and. Once you're done, there's another star coming through and then there's another star coming through. And I think it's so easy to, you've had your time. And I remember, I think Matthew Macklin, when I first turned pro, used to say, you get one shot at it, you get one career, make decisions that are best for mm. you in your career. Your coach can get 50 tries to reach the top with 50 different fighters and the same with a promoter, whereas you get one shot at it. So do things, don't be loyal to someone and hinder your career when you've got to make decisions, whether they're easy or hard, that the best for you and it, it's probably one of the best advice I've been given since saying I'm pro you do only get one shot at it your coach can have you no know, 100 shots with 100 different fighters to make it to the big time you don't I mean I suppose it makes it even more important um, or even more invaluable with you and your family set up having three other fight brothers that have all fought at, at, at elite levels he went to professional 
my couple my three brothers were with Frank Warren and two of them mm. were quite happy at the time. So they advised me and you now I had meetings with different promoters, but I ended up going with Eddie and match room. Mm-hmm. My three brothers were a completely different promoter. And I think that shocked people at the time. But again, I had to do what was best for like me. For and you, I think in through the circumstances exp- that you had, yeah. Yeah, and I think through experience of seeing what we how my three brothers' careers were going and whether they were active or inactive, it kind of helped me with my decision. So again, it was another point where having three older brothers definitely benefited me. How big a role do your brothers play in the decisions and the choices and the build, more to the point, the build up to the fights that you have? Um, not so a very much, close unit. Yeah, not you? so much decisions, but it's more like even when I went in the, the Super Series and it was no draft pick and I was messaging my brothers, who shall I pick out the four of them? I'd, like Rhodes was first pick and then I was second. And I can't really make decisions, even if I go for something to eat, I'd say I'll have what he's having. Or I'd, like, I'd, I'm quite indecisive and <laughs> they didn't really help because the three of them kind of, they probably rate me more than anyone else and they probably put me on this pedestal and right. I asked them who do you think I should pick and the three replies was any you beat all four of them yeah. just pick who you want to pick and I was like that really weren't the answer I wanted like, <laughs> and I probably ended up picking the toughest one out the four as well to be honest with you but in terms of decisions it, the book stops at me I always make my own decisions but in terms of like through camp or fight week they'll always stay and yeah. I think they kind of know know what I'm going through know probably what I'll need to do and they'll ask me do I need do you want to drop me to do this for you? Because they probably know they've been in that position and yeah. it's a, like it's a pain doing certain things. And so they'll always try and help me whenever they can, but then they always, they know not to be too helpful because it's a bit patronizing. And when you're mm-hmm. making weight, it's a little bit, you get a little bit snappy and stuff. So they kind of know the boundaries, which I think, you know, it's a talent within itself. You get, you know, your mum asking you, mum used to say, just have water. It's, it's got no calories in and I understand that it still puts weight on you when you get on the scales and stuff. So it's just, I think unless you're a fighter and you've been here, you don't probably kind of understand what, what a fight week's like. And I've had them three, you know, my whole career. Yeah. And they're probably the three people I'd have around me more than anyone yeah. else. And I've said before in interviews, fighting anywhere in the world doesn't bother me. I could be the other side of the world, but if I've got them three with me, yeah. I feel like I'm in my mum's. Is it the same with you for them? Yeah, yeah. I feel like yeah. I'm in my mum's front living yeah. room as long as I've got them three right. with me fight week. And it's just, that that's my home. That makes me feel at home once I've got them three around me. So I've traveled as a, you know, many times a professional now and, it's got the same in- impact as if I'm fighting in you know, in the Echo Arena or the MNS Arena. How how important was your amateur career? A lot of a lot of people make a lot of pay a lot of um attention and put a lot of stock in amateur careers. I mean, people talk about Anthony Joshua, and every time yeah. Anthony Joshua doesn't put on a good performance, yeah. they'll say, Well, he's still learning um on the job, yeah. metaphorically, and he didn't have much of an amateur career. Yeah. With the exception of of Liam, all of you boys. Uh, you know, achieve things at amateur level, at international amateur yeah. level. How important, in order to get a pedigree and a background and a base to leap off to go into the pros, is a good amateur career? It's a, it's a, it's a tricky question because I think it's massive. I'd always advise, like when you see fights, you want to turn professional at eighteen, nineteen. I'd always advise them to go and do two, three years on the international circuit. You think you pick up. Personally, me, I done just under three years on the GB team, and I learned so much in those three years, and I think I improved massively as a fighter. At the same sense, a good amateur doesn't always make a good professional. I think we've seen that many mm-hmm. a time. Many Olympians turn pro and don't quite do it as a professional, and you've seen a lot of professionals who are having good professional careers who didn't really do much as an amateur. So it's not always a guarantee, but I do think a good amateur will always give you that springboard, it'll give you a good promoter, it'll give you a good back, and you'll get on the big shows and you see a lot of fighters now having to turn pro doing no ticket deals, having to sell tickets to pay for their opponents, to pay for themselves. And that's that's a tough job on itself, never mind the actual training and fighting side of it. So I'd always advise anyone to try and do as much as they can as an amateur. I mean, obviously you uh win the nationals, mm. you 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 box in the Commonwealth, you win a silver. Yeah. Yeah. But you miss out on the 2012 Olympics. Yeah. W- what happened there? I went to a tournament in Turkey and I had four fights. I won three and then it, there was three people who qualified. So the first, second and third place. And I lost in a semi-final to the Azerbaijan. And I believe I should have won the fight, to be honest with you. But it was a decent fight. And then rather than have a box off with the other losing semi finals they basically just had the the winner, whoever the winner right. beat in the final. And the, the home fight of the Turkish beat the, the Azerbaijan in the final. So it... it it's one of them. It'll always kill me because I was speaking about this the other day. It's like the Olympics is happening this this summer, and you wouldn't really know what was happening. Whereas I think because I was around at the London mm. one, it was huge, and like it was like 
200 days to London, 100 days, and we were always getting the countdown and everything. Every tournament we were going to, whether you won or you lost, was it's all preparation for London, and it was such a big thing. And to feel like I deserved to be there and not go was 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 tough to take. And even now, I've had a great professional career and mm -hmm. not better career than most of the you look back team. On it. Yeah, I'd still I'd love to be an Olympian. I think it's an unbelievable. Really? Yeah, I'd love to be an Olympian. I wouldn't swap what I've won, but it still does like it's Brain probably one, with you. yeah like yeah. I'd, I'd love to be an olympian and not so much the fighting side of just the whole like i went to commonwealth and yeah. yeah you're in the athlete village all the other athletes mm -hmm. it's an amazing experience and i can imagine the olympics to be you know 10 times bigger than that so yeah i do it does bother me that i missed out on that but i said the day i turned professional i wasn't gonna let it hold me back i still believe that i have a good career with or without the olympics and no i, I believe i have yeah because i mean you know, obviously in recent olympics you've seen ben whittaker go to the yeah. olympics and pretty much throw his medal away yeah. because, and I quite admired that actually. I kind of yeah. quite like that attitude of, uh, you know, the idea that he didn't come here to win silver. He yeah. came here to win gold. Just out of curiosity, what do you make of Whitaker? His antics aren't my cup of tea. I think if he can do it, like he's trying to be like Naz, if he, Naz yeah. was doing it at Madison Square Garden and world title mm -hmm. fights, not against like journeyman, but I do think he's, he's a great talent. Yeah. I think he's a very, very good fighter. And I do think he will go go to the top if he keeps doing what he's doing. I'd just like to see him just do the basics a little bit better and get rid of his opponents. And then if he can do that at the highest level, all his, his showboat and then you no know, fair play to him. But I think doing it against, you know, sometimes Jamie Manu who've finished the day's work mm -hmm. and then gone to, I there to help him out really. I think it's a little bit, yeah, yeah, disrespectful. I, mean, I, like I, think, he's got, I think he's got charisma. It'll yeah, be definitely. interesting to see if he can step up and, do it when he's fighting better fighters. That's what I mean. Yeah, I think Prince Azim done it at the yeah. highest level, and yeah. I think he was he was a one off. I was but... I was always had mixed emotions about Prince Azim. I didn't because I I always got his fight in the back of my mind when he fought Steve Robinson yeah. in Cardiff, yeah. and he took the piss out of him. I yeah. thought, and it was just a little bit too much. Yeah, that's I me. Mean. I think that's when you're seeing it now with people who are there to kind of help with and not there to to beat him, so to speak. And mm -hmm. he's doing it to them. I think it's a little bit disrespectful. But do you? A little bit. Yeah, I do think so. But. I think talent wise, he's a very, very good fighter. And I yeah. do think he will go go to the very top. And I'd like to see him do it at the highest level. I think he should just go about his business a little bit more this time. But like I say, he's, a, he's definitely a, a talent. But he's going to sell himself, isn't he? I mean, he's, yeah, he's exactly. Gonna, I think he's, he's well known himself. now compared to the yeah, other the other Olympians because yeah. of it and because of, like I say, he's showboat, but he's putting in good performances with it as well. So, no, who am I to say that? When you're saying mm -hmm. before, no, I, I mean, be a bit listen, more you're like heavyweight. Yeah, he's so, a lot heavyweight. Yeah, no, I do think he's a talent. I think he's a very good fighter. You, you, so after the Olympics and the, and the disappointment of the Olympics, you then turn pro. Yeah, right. And you sign with Eddie. Mm -hmm. Your your career follows the same sort of path as your brothers, and you get to a point where twenty five or twenty four fights, twenty five fights you're unbeaten. Yeah. You've got the British Championship. You're then, from my understanding, there's an opportunity that Eddie wants you to fight James the Girl. Yeah. Tell me about that because that's the fight that didn't happen, and I get the impression it might have been something that disappointed your promoter no i think it was what disappointed me promoter because you chose to go into the um uh the uh super series, series. Yeah. yeah well i was mandatory for the wbc world title and they kept like messing me about for months and then eddie said do you want to fight again and i said yeah and then the, the world box super series wanted me to yeah. go in the tournament and I remember I drove down to, to London. I went to Eddie's office and I sat and had a meeting and I agreed the split for the De Gale fight and stuff. And he said, we'll have a contact with you within 48 hours. And then I drove from that office to another place, had a meeting with the Sowlands. And to be honest with you, it sounded too good to be true. And they were talking all like who was going to be in the tournament and the, the money yeah. that was in it. And to be honest with you, my mom was basically just, I can't wait to get home and tell everyone I'm fighting De Gale and in the summer and stuff. And that was you not know, a fight that I wanted, I believe. Like Jay's, the girl's a great fighter. I grew up watching him. He was you knowing on my brother's team as an amateur and that was a great fighter, but I feel he was there for the taking at the time. And right. I think he lost to Caleb Truax the next fight. He was a fighter he should have yeah. should have been comfortable. But and then I, I goes home and then I'm still waiting for Eddie. And I don't know whether the IBF were being a bit funny over the girl having another volunteer. He had a mandatory and then he just had a voluntary and he never ever sent me the contract. And then the BBC sent me a contract out for to fight Drell in LA in September. I said, okay, so I signed it. And then a week later, he said, that's going to be a different date in Detroit now. And I felt, so I just, I said to the tournament, look, I'll go in it. I'll, I'll give up my WBC with a title shot and I'll go in the tournament. I, I think I'd been waiting like nine months or something to get that fight sorted. So it was more, like I'd loved the De Gale fight and 
that's probably been that was my first choice and then when that didn't work that i was i just wanted to be a world champion yeah. and they were two world title and fights and then, yeah. and then the minute groves agreed to go in the tournament i knew there was a belt yeah. in it for me so it made a little bit more sense whereas i wouldn't have went in the tournament if there wasn't a world title at the end of it yeah. yeah but going back a step because i've stepped forward and gone past the fight that you had with rocky fielding mm. and to win the british title and obviously your trainer's joe gallagher yeah and joe worked with your brothers as well mm. and the 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 complete destruction yeah of rocky felding who came in with a pretty good reputation yeah went on to win a world title literally six fights after you destroyed mm. him yeah um joe gallagher tells me a story about the ma the manner in which they approached or you approached that fight mm. which was rocky felding being very highly motivated and very highly charged mm. and you and joe deciding that you're going to stay stay in the dressing room yeah. for 15 minutes yeah and leave him in the ring yeah um and what the thought process was behind that and what the outcome was as a result of it tell me about that yeah i think it's just joe joe loves to just take authority and he was like we'll go out when we're ready and then i think they come in and say like three minutes to go and stuff and then they come in and start to knock on the door and joe locked the door and was saying we'll go out when we're ready and stuff and i think he's just done it to wind them up but then we go out and we actually get to buy rocky's done his ring walk and i'm about to do me and then I needed the toilet, I needed a wee. So then where they like a platform you walk down, I had to go underneath it, do a piss and then come back out. So I think that was added to the delay a little bit. But yeah, it was a, it was a good, it was an enjoyable fight for me. It was a local derby. A lot of people were speaking about it. Yeah, 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 which was quite quite satisfying. Like I say, yeah. it was the first time I was seeing people in my own city saying, oh, it's a good fight, I think it might be too soon. I think Rocky, and it's the first time I'm seeing people saying I might lose in my career and kind of got me back up a little bit because it was always a fight I believed I'd win. and. I never once seen it as like a tough fight for me, but it got a lot of interest. They sold the out, the out, out and stuff. So it was definitely one of my most satisfying wins, although probably not one of my best. I don't know, mate. Knock yourself yeah. out in the first round and do the job, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It, was a, it was a good fight for me and to win the British title and become, I'd wanted to win that for so long and I probably got to a point where I was ready to fight for it, but Paul had it, yeah. my brother, so I had yeah. to wait for him to vacate. So I kind of carried on with my career and, Went the like the WBC route and then the minute he vacated, me and Rocky right. got put in for it. So it was to to complete the set. They all added at the same time and to add the fourth one too. It was was a little bit of history, which I think won't be beaten for a, a good while. Um, fighting George Groves, mm. Fochi sits here telling me how much he hated George Groves and how yeah. much he you know he wanted to conceptualise how he could get his fists in a glove and how he could imagine yeah. putting it through George's face and God knows whatever else he wanted to do to it. Yeah. Do, do, does the fighters? Uh, that you fought and building up to that point has anyone ever invoked that emotion in you did you have that sort of feeling no towards anything was judged no. differently with you and um, behaved in a certain way no and i think i don't know you probably have to ask george this but i think it probably annoyed him a little bit that he probably couldn't get a rise from me i think he was always at his best with the gale yeah, fight where it was a bit of back and yeah. forth and yeah. the frotch fight and he, he can't and then the eubank fight is three probably best performances within fights where he could have a bit of mind yeah. games before and I think he just got no reaction from me. I've never, I've never been as emotionally involved in a fight against an opponent. It was always, and even with George, it wasn't about beating George Groves. It was about taking his belt off him, and it was more a case of becoming a world champion in that tournament. I'd have preferred it to have been Groves in the final because he was the champion that mm -hmm. that entered with the belt. But it was always just about not becoming a world champion. I've wanted that since I was you know, seven, eight years of age, and. It's just a, a, a career's work. It's not just a training camp for that fight. It's everything you put into to become become a world champion. And every title I'd won previously, I probably never really sat back and enjoyed. So I was never satisfied. I always knew where I wanted to be and what I wanted out of the sport. Can I ask you how um, um, achievements change you and build your mindset? You you know you beat Rocky Fielding to get the British. You win the English mm. after your eight fight, right? So each one of those are milestones that build something in you. But when you become a world champion, it's something even more significant, isn't it? But what changed in you? Did, I mean, you you already had the belief, but did you suddenly become I'm a world champion? Yeah, it's like the two part. Like one part felt like the minute the ref waved it off, it was more. I think because so many people had said I was going to be a world champion from let's say very early on in my career, two three fights in, it was like I was a shoe in for a world title, and it kind of took away any. Praise when I won the English title, no one really cared. I was going to be a world champion. I won the British title. But you would okay. have cared, though, wouldn't you? Yeah, but I think if I could give myself advice going back, I'd probably sit back and enjoy 
the milestones on the way there because right. I was never satisfied. I always wanted to be a world champion. So when I was British champion, yeah, okay, great, but the three brothers have had one themselves. So even when I took the right. belt to see people, oh yeah, it's the same it before. As, yeah, it's yeah. the same as then. So right. it, it kind of wasn't really a big deal and it kind of felt like relief. I'd finally done it. I'd been chasing something for so long and it was more everyone else had said I was going to yeah. do it as well. I think if someone wins a world title, that probably wasn't supposed to. Mm -hmm. It's more like big deal whereas I kind of felt like I just proved a lot of people right and it was probably a bit I remember like going into the fight I thought if I lose this I have waited this long and gone through this to get one shot I might not get another world mm -hmm. title shot and little doubt start creeping in but when I won it felt like a bit of relief but when I was but a did kid you know it's a gear change in yourself I mean I've, I've spoken to other guys that have won world titles and they they know it's a gear change. They know there's something different about them. Yeah. Something's different about how people react to them. And there's almost a different set of belief that comes into them. I'm, you know, not I'm not saying they all get big billy bo you know, billy big bollocks. They get yeah. a belief system. What was that the same for you? Did you go, yeah, well, it's I'm the world same, champion? It's now. the exact same when like you win your first national title as an amateur, you're all of a sudden I'm the best in the country. And it gives you that little bit of a whoever you're fighting, I can beat him. I've beat out like I've I've become a national champion. And the same when you're a world champion, like I walked the ring first world title defence at Madison Square Garden and I walked the ring as a world champion mm. and it kind of just gives you that little bit of aura yeah. about like I'm not going to be a world champion I am a world champion the best in the world and it, it is a good thing to have but it, it kind of like when I was a kid and I dreamed oh, I want to be a world champion and you'd always think that's the the mountain and mm -hmm. think oh the winner will win a world title that's it and my life's complete and it was great winning it but I kind of realised it just set you always want more i think yeah. as a fighter as a uh, you know a competitor as a athlete you just always always want more never satisfied and i just set loads more goals and realized that, be that ambitious. Was, yeah that wasn't the top of the mountain which yeah. i always believed it would have been you have two more fights after that um one of them i think you were particularly impressive in which, which was on the undercard of the Ruiz fight wasn't it yeah yeah and those two fights take you towards canelo everest yeah now the, that particular fight obviously is going to be a significant fight. It's mm. going to be a very economically rewarding fight. Yeah. But your preparation for that fight, okay. you're in COVID. Yeah. Right. You've got five weeks' notice. Mm. You can't get sparring partners. Mm. Can't go to, you know, people can't stay in hotels. You can't go around yeah. anywhere. So, what made you take that fight? I mean, you've had two, you, you, you're super middleweight. You're clearly at a situation where in your amateurs, you fought a light heavy. Yeah. Was there any thought process before the Alvarez fight that you were going to step up to light heavy? I think from very early on in my career, early on in my career I always believed I'd be a light heavy. I was six foot three, I was tall for the weight, and it was always a case of when, do you know what I mean? But yeah. I just, I, I always felt like I believed I was the best in the world, super middleweight, and I believed I could, given the opportunity, I could have unified yeah. the belt and, 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 and won them all. But I didn't get those opportunities, and I'd called for the Canelo fight for so long, and it got offered, and it, Looking back now, if I knew his plan was to go and dispute that super middle, I'd have probably said, no, go and fight one of the other champions and I'll fight you next or the one after it. But I, I kind of thought, I was told he, he was fighting a super middle and then he's going to go back to middleweight and fight Golovkin. So I thought, if I don't take it now, I'm, I'm probably going to go to light heavyweight. He's at middle and the fight's gone. And I think because I'd, I'd wanted it for so long and I got given the opportunity. Why did you want it? Was, because he's because just the of biggest the fight in the sport. Right. Yeah, both. He's just, he was part of our best in the world at yeah. the time. And, I'd never ever thought about fighting him. Obviously, he fought my brother Liam at, at 154, yeah. and I'd never dreamed he, he'd, he'd be at my weight. In my eyes, he was always a middleweight. I never believed he'd he'd stay at super middle. If like I said, if I knew he was going to, I'd have probably waited, done a better camping. But then, the longer I'd have waited, the more I definitely outgrew the grown the weight, mm. and I realised that once once I was in there with him. Are you conscious of the of the of the circumstances you're finding? This is not the best preparation because I think Joe talked about a, a quote where it was because of the nature of the preparation, because of the lack of opportunity you had to spar and to be really prepared for the person that you were fighting, mm. it was almost like you were delivering up the belts. I think the quote is you were delivering up the belts for yeah. Canelo rather than Canelo being delivered up for you. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, I agree. But I think, as I touched on before, as a fighter, I think you know, I've had good camps and I haven't really boxed the best. And I've had, like, the fight you just mentioned, the one on, in New York on the... Ruiz on the card. I had a, a terrible camp for that. Like I didn't really, I, I hit my hand one of my first few spars and didn't spar. And then, because it was Madison Square Garden, I thought I'm not missing this opportunity. And I put in one of my career best performances. So I think you just always got that belief that 
good preparation, bad preparation, I get it right on the night. I always have. I yeah. was unbeaten, so I always believed I get it right, regardless if it was Canelo Alvarez or anyone else. I just believe. Put them little gloves on. I switch on, and I no, I, I and I, I never believed. I say until I got in there, I realised I'd outgrown the weight. I didn't know in the build-up beforehand, oh, the weight's going to kill me and stuff, because it wasn't so much as getting to the weight, it was more the last few fights beforehand, I'd stopped putting as much weight on from weighing to fight, and I don't right. know whether that was my body not absorbing it properly, I don't know, but I think that was, the warning signs were there, but like I say, I, I couldn't afford to to give up the opportunity, because I knew my time, I, super middleweight was, was right. coming short, and I believed he was going to middleweight, so I thought, if I'm going to fight him, this is the only chance. What was the build-up like? I mean, it's one of those, isn't it, where it's a superstar fight, isn't it? Yeah. And all the attention that goes with it, it would have been on a different level for you um, in terms of the world media would have been focused on it and yeah. really focused on it because you're both champions. He mm -hmm. comes with all the reputation that he comes with. You have come with a very significant reputation mm -hmm. and also a world title holder. What was that experience like? It was... Or was it diminished by COVID? It was a bit of both, yeah. It yeah. was a bit of both. Like, I've seen me, me brother fight him, and that, that fight he was huge, and you know, all the fans are there. And I think because he fights on like the Mexican holidays, it was all the Mexicans there. And that was probably what I'd envisioned me fighting and being like. And then I think with COVID, there was like barely any fans there. All my media stuff was done through Zoom. I think when we got the hotel, there was just us in the hotel. I, my team had one floor, his team had another floor, and I didn't see them at all all right. week. It was a bit of a a bit of a strange situation. It was probably what a bit, not a bit massively diluted for what it probably probably should have been. But again, it was it was COVID, and and I think I've been out the ring for thirteen months. So if I didn't fight then. I don't know when I'd have, I'd have fought after that. So there's a lot of factors in probably why I shouldn't have took the fight. But there was also factors in why I believe I, I had there, to yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah I think I'd, say I'd, I'd sat out the ring for thirteen months, and again that doesn't help with making weight as well you're sitting in you no know, lockdown drinking mm. beer in the garden in the mm. sun and it's just one of them I, I got back in a boxing gym and the fight was offered to me i started training because they were saying we'll try and get you out early in the new year and the wbc title was vacant and i think i was no me and yield number one and two in the in in the rankings so i thought maybe i could get that and then obviously canelo moved up and said i want to fight for the wbc so then that fight was offered so yeah it it's all ifs and buts but i believe now, if I could go back and change it, I would, but I do believe it made me a better fighter because of it. It, it highlighted areas what I need to change in my me, in, in me team, in my career, and just as a fighter, areas I need to improve in as well. So I do think, although losses are the worst in the world, you mm. do you can take the, the positive from them and you can become a better fighter because of them. Can I ask you a blunt question that mm -hmm. um, others have taken exception at? Was this levels in this fight with Canelo? Um, He's the best I fought, definitely. I don't. I, I do believe. Like I say me at my best. I, I believe it's a different fight. But yeah, when he's in, no, he's he's a very very good fighter. You've could, very... The, could the best version of you beat the best version of Canelo? It it's mad because I don't think the best version of Canelo is at one seven five. I think the best version of me would be at one seven five. I think you've seen with the with the Bevo fight. He's right. not. I think he carries too much weight. He yeah. tires. He's sl a lot slower at one seven five. So. It's hard to say, but I think the best version of me, I think I could do what you know, what Bevo done and beat him, I think. But I didn't. I got my opportunity and I never. Yeah. And like, I, I hate people who sit and make excuses up. I, I stepped in the ring regardless of the mm. circumstances and, and the better man on the night won. So I always give him his credit. And it's not like I lost to you know, an, an English level or British title fight. I lost to, uh, you no, know, he is a special fighter. And even when you're in with him, little things he does, it's different to what other fighters do. You can see his kind of, his brain ticking where he's trying to position you. And, He's always kind of tried to be that one step ahead of you. So yeah, he is a good fighter. Like I say, I learned from from being in with him and now in an ideal world, I'd love another opportunity, but I don't think it the paths will ever cross again. I mean, Billy just almost talked about him and and he felt that he was um he was surprised that he didn't hit as hard as he thought he would do. Yeah. Um but I think he described it and and what he actually said was um, he was very clever at letting you get away with stuff early that he'll then capitalise later in the fight. Did you have that sort of experience with him? Yeah, I agree. Like where, even now, people say, "Oh, he boxing. Oh, what was his power like?" And I think it was it's okay. Like it wasn't like I probably faced bigger it wasn't punches. Concussive. Yeah, it wasn't like it, his power's not it, for me. His defence was really, really good. He was so hard to hit, clean, with and meaningful. I thought, I thought like jabs were pretty easy to hit and with. Then anything meaningful after that, he kind of makes you miss or even like takes the sting out of it. So it's very rare you hit him and think you've like 
you felt that mm-hmm. sort of speaking. I thought his defense was very good. His his positioning, like because he's so short, he's kind of fighting and moving and keeping you thinking. And then before you know it, he's crept in and he's in range and you throw a jab and hit you and stuff. So he's he's a very clever fighter and certain things didn't surprise me. Like I say like his power, I didn't think was exceptional, but his his defense and how hard he was to a clean definitely surprised me. You go twelve rounds with him. I yeah. think it was a pretty convincing victory yeah. for him, but. For you, during this fight, what is happening from from the first round to the way the fight progresses? What's going on in your mindset? Um, I think I just, to be honest, with you, I think I probably just sulked most of it. I think I knew you did what? Just sulked most of the fight. I think right. I knew I probably weren't at my best. I knew I'd probably outgrown the weight. I think my arm was getting worse as the fight was going on. Right. So I knew I kind of like if you put me in the ring now and I lose eleven rounds, I still believe if I catch it in round twelve, yeah. I can knock it out. Whereas I think. The way I was, like what I was feeling, the way my left arm, I kind of knew I didn't have it in me to to knock him out either. So it was more, like I knew he was never going to stop me. So it was kind of just, just do what you're doing. And I kind of knew I was going to get beat on points. I knew that like he was running away with the rounds from round six onwards. He was kind of getting a lead. And like I say, I just knew I never had that, that pop, that fire, like yeah. the, the, the power left in me to to kind of level the fight, which I always believe I have got, regardless of who I'm in with. But yeah, I just knew that version of me. No, I think you need the best version of me to to potentially beat Canelo. So that version of me definitely wasn't going to. So it was just, but I said I'd still be in there with him now. I don't believe he would have stopped me. Your relationship with Joe Gallagher, Joe Gallagher at this point, yeah. you go separate ways. Mm. You've obviously, he's been very instrumental in your career. He's been there as he was with your brothers. Mm. Um, what changed? What made you change them? A lot of things, to be honest with you. I think it was a lot before that fight. Like, I, he, he was my manager as well, and I left him as a manager early, like a couple of years before. And it was more just, I don't know, just certain reasons the relationship wasn't what it was on a personal level. I think that In what way? just as a person, I, 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 I don't know, I believe he's, I think he, he was more concerned about himself, his own record, his own, how many world titles he can win, his own. I think rather than I think he betrays it's about the fighters, but it I think really? it, yeah, I think it's about yeah. him. And I think to say the relationship just didn't just started dwindling a little bit before the Canelo fight. And I think I think a bit of both. It wasn't one of them where I lost and I oh, spat me dummy out and blame the team. Like I took that loss, mm. that was all me. And it, but I think it just highlighted areas what I needed to to do and you no know, change the team was definitely one of them. But yeah, it was just more the relationship wasn't what it was. And I think a personal relationship then breathed into the gym and the right. gym relationship wasn't the same and I think it's the same for, for me three brothers as well right okay what did it do to you Callum to lose and I mean the psychological challenges that would have brought for you I mean you're undefeated you now lose and you lose to someone that has great recognition and yeah. people would have said that you know you've lost to a great fighter yeah but that doesn't matter does it yeah that that's what, what i'm going to say what that, does it do for, what does it do to you oh, you lost to i yeah. think i don't care like i think what we touched on before i think you're a bit throughout the years you build this invincibility and you believe i can beat anyone in the world and as long as i get it right i will and then i think when you lose it kind of burst that bubble and yeah like i said i didn't believe i was going to go and beat in my old career but you just never think it's going to be this one mm. where you lose. You always think it'll be further down the line. So it was it was a tough one to take. And again, you get people say, "Oh yeah, you lost, you lost to him." No, and it doesn't really make it any easier, regardless of who it is. I believed mm. I was the best in the world, and I could beat anyone. So to lose, I lose the way I did. I, I say losing to Canelo Alvarez does is isn't what bothers me. It was more my performance, performance on my side. Yeah. What kind of bothers me? I'd love to do it again and put the best version of me in with the best version of him, but. That sport, I think, for people who are beat to sit and make excuses up and stuff, you, you got in, you lost. But did it have that. a big impact on you? Because ultimately, you know, one of the things that fighters have, if they are winning fights, winning world, and getting to the level that you've got at, is a great sense of confidence and belief. And you need that to do what you do. Mm. Did it? Did it send you into a funk? Did you have a negative reaction to it? Did were you able to process it? Was it debilitating, or was it just I'm a grown up? Something's happened. I don't like it. I didn't yeah. want it, but now I'm going to come back even stronger. Yeah, I think that's what I kind of had to do. I said I've got to, I had to take full accountability, take it on the chin, and I think that's the only way you can improve from it. If I just said, "Oh, you only beat me because uh, the weight killed me," you only beat me because I, I only got five weeks' notice, then 
you can't I'm not accepting the fact that you just lost to someone who, yeah. who was who was better than you. So it dents your confidence definitely because you know you can be beat. You know yeah. there's people out there and you know you don't perform, you can lose and you know what it feels like to lose. So you never really want that that feeling again. But I think what probably played benefit to me is I moved up a weight division right after, so yeah. it's kind of like a so clean slate. You, yeah. So right. like I could still say, no, I'm going to be the best in the world. Whereas I think about I've had to stay at super middle and rebuild, and then kind of had all the belt. It was like I'm always going to be second fiddle mm -hmm. to him. So I think the fact that I moved up was like a clean slate, new trainer, new weight division. Yep. Everything was kind of new, so that gave me a kind of new lease of life. You have two fights, um, both of them very positive outcomes, mm -hmm. and you get an opportunity to have a shot at a world title against Better Beef. I mean, for you, it's, you know, you're one of those that's an elite fighter, but you don't make it easier for yourself because you've landed in yeah. the super middleweights with Canelo Everest yeah. at that time. You've now landed in the light heavies with, with better Biev. Mm. What was your approach to that fight? You mean, you, I mean, I went to see him. I saw Anthony Yard's fight yeah. against him and I thought that Anthony Yard was very effective for a period of mm. time and then better be have just bit down on the gum shield yeah. and just went on to a different level mm. um, and kind of with due respect to Anthony, put him in his place yeah. a little bit. Again, I, I don't want to dwell on your losses because you had a remarkable career and I'm a big yeah. admirer of yours, but this was a very different experience for you. This yeah. was, I, I, I actually picked you to win this fight. Yeah. I had a feeling that you would have the ability to work him over um, and you know, with your trademark left, yeah. left hook and work him to the yeah. body, and you'd start to get him on, on the move. Yeah. But this was a very really hard fight for you, and it's the first time you've been stopped. Yeah. Walk me through that experience because I what not, what I saw was I thought watching you, and excuse my ignorance, but mm. understand my words. I thought that you were surprised at the power. Um, I thought you were. Um, uh, but I think you, I, I thought you looked a bit shocked at times by what you were facing. Yeah. So that's me looking at it from, yeah. from my eyes. And I've spoken to people like Spencer Oliver and they sort of, in a more educated way, came to that conclusion. But I'm more interested in what your experience was. Yeah, no, like I say, up until the shot that put me down, the first one, I didn't really feel his power as much. It was more, I think with the ring being so small, I kind of like just couldn't keep him off me. He was, felt like he was always in yeah. front of me. And then even when he got me on the ropes, I felt like he tried to take my head off and he didn't. Yeah. He kept just throwing loads of like... Not not in shots because obviously they got power in him, but like sixty percent, and it was kind of hard to get out the way of them. And I remember thinking he'll finish now and I can retain. And it, I think tactically, I don't know whether it was a tactic on his side, but it was different to what I expected. Like expecting to throw big bombs and come out fast, didn't he? Yeah, he came yeah. out quick. Yeah. Like, say, as soon as the bell went, and I think say I feel like I had nowhere to go in the ring, and tactically I wasn't really supposed to stand and have a tear it with him. Right. But I think given the circumstances, the ring and stuff, I kind of had no choice to stand in the pocket with him, which is isn't the best idea when you're fighting someone like better Bev, but say that's the, the cards we were dealt. And again, it's more, I don't, I don't mind losing to better Bev. He's, yeah. he's, a, he's another good fighter, but it's more, say my performance yeah. wasn't what it should have been, which obviously bothers me. But again, you know, he's a, he's a very good fighter. When you say your performance, I mean, like that, I think your description is clearly much better than mine. That, that when I'm saying you were shot by the power, I, I kind of meant what you meant, which is I, I, you couldn't keep him off you. Yeah. And what, why was that? I mean, what was it? I mean, what, what was it about what he was doing and and your reaction to it that determined that outcome? Yeah, a bit of both. I think I say I've been out the ring a long time, so I think I was never going to start quick. I kind of knew that. I think when we got there, it was the day of the fight. I seen a tweet saying I think the ring was eighteen by eighteen foot or something. So I knew what their tactics were going right. to be to put it right on me. And... Didn't you have any choice in the ring size? No, I think it's their promotion no. in it. No, it's whoever's the promoter. So they um, Eddie lost the purse bid, so the top rank show. So they put the the ring. So right. the ring was small. So I kind of knew what the plan the was. Challenge, to... I suppose, aren't you? So yeah. yeah, yeah. And then he just kind of put it right on me, and I think it's probably not inexperienced, but I've I've always been like a dominant. Force, so I've never really had to hold it, and so when he's got me in the ropes, throwing lots of shots, I probably should have held and smothered mm -hmm. him and stuff. But it's not really the type of fighter I am. So I remember just thinking I can slip, slip, and the yeah. minute he finishes, I can let man go. But he, he kept look. I say I found that a little bit awkward. The amount of like not not in shots, but like arm shots he was throwing just to kind of like keep me off off balance, so to speak, and stop me letting any of my my power shots go. But I think tactically he got a he got a bang on and I say I wasn't I didn't start quick enough and by the time you no know, I think the 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 not and shots what I was I was on about were, were marking me up and, mm. and then he caught me with a good shot in 
in the round would have finished and I say he managed to get the finish but no no excuses there. How good was he? He's good ability wise he's I say I don't think he's he's as good as Canelo. He's just effective. He's good at what he does. Mm-hmm. He's got good you no know, good straight punches and his feet are very underrated. He closes the gap a lot quicker than what he looks quite robotic. But his feet are good. He's from a good Russian background. He's a he's a very good international amateur and I think he was amateur world champion as well. So I kind of expected it. But yeah, I think his feet are good. He's good at say positioning you where he wants you. And no, I think he he's a three belt world champion for a reason. Who wins the fight? Between him and I mean, we saw Bivol a lot of mm. when Craig Richards fought Bivol, everyone mm. thought, "Hmm, not yeah, that much, what, is I it?" And if Craig had, if well, Craig had yeah. been a little bit, yeah. more, a little bit believed himself a little bit more, he might have been able to win that yeah. fight. And then we've seen Bivol kick on a bit, haven't we? Yeah, and I think he plateaued out a bit. I think his, his level of opposition dropped a bit. That's no disrespect, but I think when he but now he the, looks the Canelo one, he yeah. looked really good. Gabriel yeah. Ramirez, he looked Absolutely. really good as well. Yeah. So I think he, the better the opponent, so I think you're probably see the best version of him. I just don't know. I just don't know if he's hard enough to keep. Better be off for the right. full twelve. I think he'll be on him for the, for the twelve rounds, and he say he's physically strong. And Bivol's probably the more skillful, got the better. No, he's very mm. fluent. He's got good, good boxing ability, but he just doesn't punch as hard. And I don't know whether at some point Better be will won't mind taking one or two to get to yeah. him, and, and I'll just put it on him. But it's a great fight as a boxing fan. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's yeah, it's, it's, it's a fight that probably should have happened. I think they both yeah. been world champion over five six years or something. And, it took a while for it to happen. Saudi but, money now, isn't it? Yeah, do you know what yeah. I mean? I think it took the Saudi money to, to get it to happen. But no, as a, as a boxing fan, it, it's a fight that I'm definitely looking forward to. So that leads me into the next question. Mm. Where are you in the great scheme of things? You don't you don't have anything in the diary? No. What's happening with you? Um, not at the moment. I don't know. I, I'm say I spend some time with my family. I'm getting married in, in a couple of months. And yeah. then I don't know. I think a lot depends on what happens with the the undisputed fight and what happens with the belts after well, that gonna get, they're going to get scattered aren't they yeah hopefully yeah. that's the plan yes I, I just want to be a world champion yeah. that, that's always that's always motivated me I've never been motivated by no financial gains and I've always been motivated by being the best and being able to call myself a, a two eight world champion as a goal so if if one man's going to keep the belts and do what Canelo's doing at one six eight mm-hmm. and kind of holding them ransom then I don't know where the motivation will come from then, but if you no know, the belt scatter up and you no know, there's there's four off for grabs, then I'll definitely believe I'm good enough to win one of them. So does that mean that is retirement on the table for you? Yeah, potentially, but it's not that. No, I believe I'm finished. I believe I'm probably better now. No, than I don't ever think you are. Yeah, I'm, I'm it's more just motivational. Are. Like I think in boxing, you've got to have when it gets tough, you've got to have that reason why. And a lot of people's is financial, yeah. which. But you can thankfully have a bit of both I don't really have it yeah and then it's oh, I want to be a world champion and I've been a world champion so I've kind of ticked those two boxes but my reason why was always to be a world champion yeah. again I want to be another world champion and if that's kind of tied up for the time being then like I say I don't really know where where the motivation will come from would you fight Anthony Hart? yeah so definitely I think if for a world title he's got good rankings but he's got good rankings yeah. so I think if the belts do come up then One of we are going to be shot. the names yeah. that, that are, are being that's what's being linked isn't it that's that's what's being mooted around is that potentially that you could be fighting Anthony Yards. Potentially, yeah. yeah. Say if you can get a world title for it, then then why not? It's a it's a good fight. I think in Boati, you know, you've got Richards fighting on the the five v five. Now there's a lot of good good domestic heavyweights, but light heavyweights. Sorry, but I think the hopefully the belts can scatter about mm. and there's a little well, bit more, little bit more meaning go, behind the belts. There's yeah. no two ways about it. Yeah, fingers crossed. So that's so that's from that point of view, we can take this as a given. Yeah. You're not retiring anytime soon, and 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 hopefully yeah. the next opportunity you get might be a world title shot. Yeah, fingers crossed. Or even yeah. if you have to win a fight, to then in, in yeah, the to, shop, to as long as I know it's it. yeah. there, so to speak, rather than you're just fighting for the sake of waiting for for a, for a shot at a champion when there's only one champion and yeah. there's a massive queue, so to speak. That's a little bit disheartening. But if the belts are vacant, then I definitely believe I should be there or thereabouts for for one of the vacant ones. Is boxing a difficult sport to retire from? It seems yeah. like it is. Yeah, I think it is for like I said, I know personally from I'm speaking to my brothers, I think you kind of I think it depends. There's a lot of different circumstances. I think one's probably retired having not fully achieved what they set out to do. And I think yeah. that must be hard having to give up on mm-hmm. a dream that you've had for so long. Like if you don't win your world title or some leave it say no money and you've given twenty years of their life to something to be left with not at the end of it. And they probably question whether it was all worth it. And it's just different different aspects to what people probably struggle with. People probably struggle with like losing their identity yeah. one minute to the man. I think Ricky Hatton struggled with that one minute he had Kelbrook. thousands of people. Yeah. yeah, and all of a sudden you 
you're not that person yeah. anymore. And I think I think that's why you see a lot of fighters come back. I think they just miss the limelight. And I think you've seen it with Mayweather. Now he doesn't need the money. I think he just craves the, the attention, craves the attention yeah. and the limelight. I think a lot of fighters struggle with that as well. I think, I say, I do think they struggle. Because you said it, haven't you? I want to be a two-weight world champion. Yeah. I would probably find it hard walking away knowing I never quite fulfilled what I set out to do. Yeah, I think but I guess once if you I've, go and get your world title, yeah, then, yeah, I, then I, you I, might be I can, fulfilled. I'd be like content yeah. and I can retire now and achieve what I want. I think... When Any I, part of you that worries about it? About what you'll do next? Um, not really, no, because I, I say I'm not the most outgoing. I don't crave the attention. Yeah. I think I, I've got two kids at home and I kind of quite a laid back family man so I think I kind of just slot into the life I can't kind of live now I, I do well to avoid the limelight but I don't know I think having that purpose and having that goal and having something to chase every day not having that will will probably affect you and I think you probably need something to do to keep you busy and something else to to, to put your mind to and put your energy to because I say it's all I've ever known I've all I've ever mm -hmm. known is boxing and I've always set goals and chased them and get up in the morning you've got a purpose to to get out of bed and go and Go and become a better fighter and something to do. And I think in one minute. But you feel comfortable you'll be able finished. to make that gear change. Do you think you feel comfortable? Hopefully, yeah, 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 hope, yeah, I do. I think uh, providing I'm satisfied with what I've done, I always wonder, could I have done mm. this or could I have done that? And I think if I went at the same professional where Eddie Vida said, Look, you can win English, British, European World, Ring Magazine, and You'd retire, I'd have took it. Yeah. But I think now I've committed to being a two eight world champion, yeah. I feel like I've got a I've got Good to achieve it before I walk Good away. Whereas if I'd never moved up, if I'd just retired after Canelo, I'd probably been happy with what mm. I'd done. But the fact that I've moved up and committed to a goal, then I feel like I've got to finish it. Um, I want to talk to you about events outside of the ring as well. You know, I, I spoke to Paul, your brother, the other day um, about um, a fighters union that he wants to start. Mm -hmm. And I know there's some momentum behind it. And I know that this is something that once upon a time, Barry McGuigan um, tried to do something similar. Mm. Um, are, you, are you involved in this? Do you subscribe to this view? No, I agree with it, but I haven't yeah. been involved. I think Paul and Stephen have been a little bit more involved in trying to get it up and running and stuff. But what are they trying to achieve? I don't know. I think it's just, it's a little bit harder in boxing because I think in football with the FA, there's just one, basically one organisation, one umbrella. And Whereas I think with boxing, there's different promoters, different, sanctioning bodies different the border controls and stuff so it's a little bit harder but i think it's just more you see far too many fighters finish boxing with absolutely yeah. not and you have really good fighters who had a decent career and it's just it's it's sad it's it's a very unforgiving sport once your time and the arm rights done you kind of just get forgotten about whereas i think in football they say you're a member of the, the fa for for life so mm -hmm. to speak and or the pfa yeah yeah the yeah. pfa sorry yeah. yeah and now if you want to go and like do your badges and stuff you can get stuff paid for like the, there's a lot of help for fa footballers after football but there's yeah. nothing for boxers and i think there probably should be but i think a lot of the problem is also how people, it's going to be funded yeah but i think that it's not even when boxers are finished i think it's people who are taking money out of paces now like sanctioning fees and stuff like yeah. that like i think where does that money go so to speak like for my last fight for for three belts i paid three percent of me pace for mm -hmm. each belt so nine percent coming out right yeah. away for, I didn't even win the belt. It's not even like I get a belt to show for it. So it's like, you just don't know where the money's going. I think there's so many people dipping into fighters' purses and then they become shocked and surprised at the end of the career when they've got nothing left. It'd be interesting to see uh, how Paul and Stephen will get the union funded because mm. unless they're going to get money from the broadcast deals, then it's going to have to come from the fighters. Yeah. And and therein becomes the problem. I think yeah. Barry had that problem, didn't he? Yeah. Um, when he wanted to set it up. And I think he was very, very much involved in McGuigan in changing some of the medical support yeah. and the the availability of medical resource yeah. around fights so that people were tended to much quicker if there was any challenges. Yeah. How do you think that people will look back on your career? Um, I can fight. I think yeah. if you ask counsel, you say, yeah, he was good. He, he, yeah. he could fight. And I think you've got you no know, mixed opinions on certain fights, whether you like them outside, during the personality. But as long like they probably call me boring and say I was quiet, but as long as I can fight and that's all I've really ever wanted. And I've never wanted, like, craved attention or praise, but just to be respected by my fellow peers. Yeah. And when my name pops up, say, yeah, he was a good fighter. He's a very good fighter. And that's all I've ever wanted. I don't want to be known as funny or outgoing or anything like that. Just as long as I'm a good fighter and I've got the, the accolades to, to prove that, which is hopefully a 2 8 world champion. How are you looking back on it? Good, I'd say I've had a good career. I think 
it's two ways you can look at it. The, the competitive side always wants more, believes I can achieve more or I should have achieved more. But the, the young kid who turned professional, who just failed to make the Olympics, if I had to said that you win English, British, European, world titles and say you earn, earn enough money, then I'd have bit your hand off for it and probably thought it was too good to be true. So I'll always be you no know, grateful for the position I'm in and you happy with what I've you achieved. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I say, and it's a bit, it, that exactly, I mean, I like, People look and say, I'd, I'd love to do what he does in there. But like, I put a lot of it, a time sure, and effort mate. into it over yeah. the years. And I do feel it's, you know, boxing's a tough sport and people put the same yeah. effort in or more as me and don't get the rewards for it. So I think you've got to just work hard and hope that, you know, things fall into place. But I say, I've, I've I put a lot of time but an effort into boxing over the last 20, 25 years since since I can remember, since I was eight, nine years old. So, it, you know, it's good to to get me rewards and yeah. hopefully I'm not finished. Well, mate, listen, I think that um, both you and your brothers have made a remarkable contribution to boxing. Thank you. And I've really enjoyed talking to you and thank you for being so upfront with me. Uh, thank you well very done, much. Mate. Thank you. Upfront with me, Simon Jordan, is brought to you by William Hill. For new weekly shows, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can find audio episodes on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. 18 plus, please gamble responsibly.